So welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, I hate you and that's so hot, sexualized anger as a problematic sexual behavior. Uh, today we're gonna be hearing from Jessica Levis and a little bit about us. We are Center for Healthy Sex. We're here in West Los Angeles. Uh, we offer everything from individual therapy, couples, group therapy, and intensives as well. And if you have any questions or, uh, you know, want more information, you can always find us at centerforhealthysex.com or give us a call at 310-843-9902. And a little bit about Jessica. Uh, she is an MFT, got her master's uh, degree in clinical psychology from Antioch University. Um, she's one of our most popular webinar speakers. So... <laughs> We're in luck, and um, she, uh, she's been trained with SASH, and that's Society for Advancement of Sexual Health, um, International Institute for Trauma and Addiction Professionals, known as ITAP, and the Association of Partners of Sex Addicts Trauma Specialists. Um, and she treats women, men, uh, couples struggling with problematic sexual behaviors, emotional dependency, uh, and betrayed partners. Um, you can find her uh, information at eastbaytherapy.com, and I believe we'll offer an easy link to that. Um, and in addition to seeing clients, she travels the country providing lectures, um, popular webinars, etc., cetera, and uh, does some writing and articles, all that. So thank you so much, Jessica. Oh man, I just <clears throat> I just blushed. Um, thank you guys. Thank you, Center for Healthy Sex, for having these webinars. They're so important to people who can't get to the right resources. Um, so my name is Jessica Leveth, and uh, I'm going to be looking down because I'm going to be reading my notes because I cannot remember everything. Um, and uh, I work primarily with problematic sexual behavior, behavior with women and then betrayed partners, so um, partners of infidelity. And uh, I work in Oakland. And um, so today I'm going to be exploring sexualized anger. Um, I use the phrase sexualized anger instead of what some are more familiar with, which is eroticized rage. Because when I started, when I read Carnes' article in 2013, it was, it was printed in 2013. I'm not sure if it was written prior to that. But um, the behaviors and the feelings that I noticed uh, or that I read, it didn't just seem to tap into rage. It was a, a, a gray area of anger. It was, it was a spectrum of anger. And so I want to call it sexualized anger so that it really is an umbrella for all the different types of anger. Um, but I'll be using them interchangeably. Um, I want to be clear from the start of this lecture that uh, sexualizing any emotion, anger, happiness, sadness, isn't inherently pathological. Um, a lot of people uh, use these, these feeling states as a way of role play or, you know, healthy sexuality. So I'm talking specifically, and I want to focus on if you or your partner are harming yourself physically or emotionally, um, or if you are reenacting a trauma, um, that becomes concerning. So um, I also wanna say that gender, uh, sexualized anger is not gender specific. So a lot of people talk about like men and perpetrators, but I've seen a lot of women who have also had these feelings of sexualized anger. And I'm looking at it in a non-forensic lens, so not in the courts, not people who have been convicted of um, really intense crimes such as rape and molestation. I'm looking at it in kind of a more primary attachment uh, partner relationships. So first I wanna explore Carnes' article, which got me really interested in this subject, um, laying out his theory or what I believe his theory of eroticized rage looks like. And then I wanna look at um, other theoretical contributions to this concept and integrate how fear and trauma and what's called um, affect dysregulation plays into sexualized anger. So let's go. Eroticized rage. So um, in his article, 
uh, Carnes talks about eroticized rage as this fusion of anger and, <clears throat> and eroticism. And he goes on to say that it's self-perpetuating, self-destructive, and once ignited, um, independent of culture and even family. So he, my guess is he's talking about it in his sex addiction model lens. So just as many things with sex addiction, once you get into that dissociative state of um, going through the addiction process, nothing else matters. Um, but it's this idea that anger and eroticism are, are fused together. And he bases, um, in the article, he bases this concept of eroticized rage on an arousal template or what's called a love map. And he cites John Money, who was a professor at uh, John, Johns Hopkins and he passed in 2006 and he was a really progressive sexologist and advocate for um, expressive sexuality. And he wrote uh, an article called Pair Bonding and Limerence in 1980. And so Money in that article coined the term love map and he's called it a, an internal blueprint for ideal eroticism. So what turns you on? That is uh, what he was coming up with as this concept. Um, and just a side note on money, uh, in 1987, he wrote a separate article calling the DSM paraphilia scientifically defenseless and based on old fashioned dogma. So he really was a champion for um, expressive sexuality. So what creates a love map? Oh, I guess I should change these. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, guys. This is the eroticized, uh, eroticized rage. And this is the love map. Forgot about that. Uh, so Karnes writes that uh, the love map uh, is comprised of a few different things. It's an individual sexual belief system, which uh, involves life experience and what they've been taught about sexuality, a person's been taught about sexuality, coupled with what they've learned about relationships and family, and that's on the right. And he says that both of these things sit atop our genetic predisposition which he doesn't really go into any further than that, but I want to also add later in the um, lecture uh, information on affect regulation and development and how that plays into the love map. I want to give a couple of case studies for you so that you can have these mulling over in your mind as we're talking about these concepts. The first one is a young boy is left to watch cartoons while his mother is upstairs getting high and having violent sex which the young boy can hear. He's scared by this. He then discovers masturbating and orgasm easing his anxiety and begins to do this as he listens to the sex. As an adult now, this man comes, to help, but comes for help because he's addicted to violent porn and cannot have an orgasm unless his partner is hurting him or porn is on uh, in the background. So that's case one. Case two. A teen girl, 14, is pulled away from an emotionally, physically, and sexually abusive home to live with her grandparents. Uh, in junior high and high school, development seems to go relatively normal, except she has little to no desire um, for dating, although others find her quite beautiful. At age 23, she has her first boyfriend, and as they become, um, they become immediately serious, and long story short, uh, they break up, and within three hours, she is posting a nude selfie with her now ex's best friend um, on Twitter. So um, in, in Carnes's article, he asks what causes this fusion of anger and sex? Let's see. Uh, this is just adapted from his article. Um, so the first thing he says is anger occurs in high risk and or fear situations. Um, by the way, I do want to just um, let you know that I will take questions afterwards so that I don't um, lose my place. Sorry. Um, anger occurs in high risk and or fear situations. So he says anger, just like fear, adds a neurochemical intensity to a sexual experience. And we will discuss this in a little while. Um, in my case example, the adult man reports he was furious and could not stop his mom from acting out when he was a child. Um, and he was also fearful for his mother and perhaps his own safety. So um, number two is 
the anger is central to the scenarios or the belief system in the arousal template. So what arouses someone with sexualized anger um, in the moment, in that current moment, whether conscious or unconscious, draws its momentum from historic, uh, historical experiences. And the fusion in this example is pretty apparent. A young boy is discovering masturbation and orgasm, and um, which can create this euphoric uh, dissociative state as he's listening to this violence. So how does this look? Um, anger, anger acts as a stimulus, is the third one. And, and he talks about the four different ways that this can present itself, anger acting as a sexual stimulus. These are the fo uh, four profiles that Carnes has. The first is power and restoration. So uh, he talks about sexualized anger can be used in an attempt to restore a sense of self. Uh, usually this involves some form of abuse or power, status, money, or leverage. Reenacting trauma of feeling powerless. And this is what Van der Kolk, he cites Van der Kolk, and I will talk about him a little bit later. Um, but this idea of repetition compulsion or mastering the trauma. Um, Carnes talks about the power and the restoration being the most common profile. Um, and this looks like holding money or a job over someone's head, um, acting out in a way in which the partner has no control. Um, this can look like se secret affairs online um, or revenge without a partner knowing it and uh, restoring that equality internally. Uh, the second profile that Carnes has is humiliation, vengeance, and retaliation. And this is, um, this is more of the forensic piece. Um, this is psychological issues are deep and profound, intention to degrade and humiliate, anger uh, and pain at the old betrayal and abuse. This is posting uh, pictures of a partner who's unaware of this. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's go into the next one, perversion. Uh, perversion in Carnes's article, he's talking about a very um, specific de definition, the pleasure in the disapproval and getting culture back for its control and rigidity. Now, I want to take care not to over pathologize here because, you know, what one culture considers perverse or one person considers perverse, another could see as a form of healthy sexuality or expressive sexuality or, you know, could be celebrating in this sexuality. And um, I really think that's up to the individual to make a choice as long as no one else is getting hurt in the process. Um, but here are the two different uh, types of definitions. The older definition is much more damning. Um, and then the fourth anger profile that he turns to is obsession. Um, and he talks about betrayal and jealousy. And he also talks um, about the co-addict in this. And I want to read this quote from him, and then I want to I want to have a new lens around it. Um, so the quote, uh, it's actually a paraphrase. Um, Kern says that the anger fueling sexual obsession, it, it's, what, it's what's fueling the sexual obsession, and that the obsessive anger, um, the rules get suspended. Anything and everything is justified because the case keeps building against the partner who has betrayed you. The co-addict becomes sexually obsessed um, as well and goes to the extreme of breaking the spouse's privacy. Now, the lens I want to have here is I work with partners. I work with betrayed partners. And these people coming into my office are extremely traumatized from having just been betrayed by someone they may have spent their entire lives with. And their world is turned upside down. And the last thing I want to do is shame them and say, you know, this is, this is, this is a form of uh, sexualized anger. I want to say, no, you, right now you are dealing with betrayal trauma and you are seeking safety uh, by any means necessary. Your body is trying to just find its own level of safety again. So um, there may be pieces of uh, obsession around safety seeking. Um, but that's, that's, that's how I see this one. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next part.
oh, sorry, went too far. So looking back at the love map, um, Carnes covers most of the love map um, and says that preferences are at least in part already term determined by our genetic code. Now, I don't know if there just wasn't um, more research out at the time, but I want to add this, this piece of affect um, development and regulation to um, sexualized anger. Um, I'm going to give a definition and some background around affect regulation and then try to tie it back to sexualized anger. I want to just throw out there that I'm not a neuropsychologist and I, I just try to do my best at simplifying um, how our bodies and our brains might be impacting us. So, affect, development, and regulation. What is affect? It is the experience of feeling states. If you're happy, if you're sad, if you're angry, your experience of feeling states. And, and then affect is that experience. So what would be affect regulation? Well, a wonderful woman named Francine Lapidus, um, she is a great writer and teacher and lecturer, and I'm gonna steal her definition. She says, it's uh, an attempt to manage our feeling states, which is complicated by our brains prioritizing survival over quality of life. So what does that mean? That means that when our bodies are in a panic state, um, it's gonna default to survival instead of emotional control. And anyone who has gotten into a heated argument has probably experienced this. You know, you're in a heated argument with your partner and the first thing that comes to your mind is, mm, I wonder how this is gonna play out afterwards. Um, that's usually not what's happening. You're, you want your way or you're feeling hurt. Um, so affect regulation is being able to control emotions. And how does it develop? How does someone's affect reg regulation develop? Well, a huge piece of it I believe is um, it has to do with the quality attachment of, of attachment with primary caregivers. I see um, a lot of these theories through a modern attachment or regulatory uh, lens. And, um, and let me explain a little bit about what that is. So Alan Shore um, is one of the forefront and, and one of the most uh, amazing writers on attachment since Bowlby and Ainsworth. And um, what he's done is he's taken classic attachment theory and added all the neuroscience behind it to basically prove what, um, what we've thought all along um, in the attachment world, uh, that the primary caregiver set out a template for our relational, um, our, our relationships later on in life. So attachment. Attachment uh, theory is essentially a regulatory theory, which can be defined as interactive regulation of biological synchronicity between two organisms. So what does that mean? That means that the two organisms in this case that, that Shore talks about is the infant and the primary caregiver, and that the nervous systems of, this in, of the infant and the primary, primary caregiver are constantly playing off of one another and, and shaping each other, mainly the mom, is shaping or the primary caregiver is shaping the child's nervous system because the child does not have the capacity to regulate itself. So what would be attachment dysregulation? The result of a misattunement um, or poor mirroring between child and primary caregiver resulting in that child's inability to self-regulate. So when a mother or a primary caregiver um, is depressed, or anxious, or abusive, or unavailable. Um, what happens to the child's nervous system uh, has very little, uh, is that it has very little to mirror off of, or whatever it does mirror off of is unhealthy, and their little bodies have to learn how to regulate themselves, or are regulating off of unhealthiness. And it's, it's driving their bodies into a state of panic, which is like fight, flight, or freeze. And when this occurs, there is trauma in the body. This is that's that's happening. And over time, if this is happening throughout a childhood and adolescence, that's how you get complex trauma is um, your body is unable to regulate itself with others or in the world. And um, a, as an adult, it may look like someone with an inability to self-regulate um, and searching for something or someone 
to help regulate them. So that phrase, you complete me, is actually you regulate me. <clears throat> These are a couple of other uh, quotes from Shore. Um, mirroring, that idea of mirroring, is a physiological call and response from mother to child occurring from third trimester to two years. So before birth, this is happening. Um, and it influences the development of the child's central nervous system and capacity for future attachment. These call and responses or attachment transactions are then imprinted into one's emotional long-term memory, creating an internal working model and encoding coping strategies. This is important. What Shore is saying is that the mirroring gets imprinted into our unconscious or implicit memory and helps form our sense of self. This mirroring also teaches our bodies how to deal with stress. <clears throat> so my second example of the 14 year old girl, the abuse started at age three and it went from about three to 14. And we're talking serious complex trauma, serious compartmentalization, serious intellectualization. Um, she never drank or did drugs because she wanted to be able to be in her body. Um, but once she got into a primary partnership, uh, it was like the floodgates of all of her trauma were unlocked. And, um, and the anger that accompanied the breakup uh, was uncontrollable for her. So affect dis, uh, dysregulation and the love map. This is actually, um, this quote is from Alex Katahakis, uh, who is the founder of Center for Healthy Sex, who brings these webinars. And she just came out with a book called uh, Sex Addiction as Affect Dysregulation. It's a great book. Um, it should be um, on everyone's shelf. <laughs> and uh and so this is a, a, a quote I got from her. Acting out sexually means precisely that. The person attempts to regulate feelings, predominantly rage at the offending gender by unconsciously acting them out in mime language of sex with fantasy, ritual, and orgasm being the auto-regulating reward. Uh, anger at the offending attachment figure is buried in the long-term memory. That's LTM, um, the emotional long-term memory. However, it activates a lust system and sexual acting out. So again, this is this idea of these attachment templates being set down into the love map. Um, let's see, let's go on. We'll go just a little bit further into um, neurobiology and then I will be wrapping up and we can take some questions. Um, so Bessel van der Kolk, who I spoke about earlier, he, this is another idea of what uh, is going on during trauma, and it is very simplified, uh, but a couple of different ways that the system is becoming dysregulated. Uh, you have the dysregulation of serotonin, and you have the, dysre uh, the dysregulation of the internal opioid system. And so both your feelings of well-being and happiness and your emotions, your regulating of emotions, and your modulating of social attachment, they're both dysregulated during trauma. Um, and chronically happening, that ends up making it very difficult to have healthy relationships. Uh, let's see. So Dr. Carnes um, asks in his article, um, why eroticized rage is left undiscovered. And one of the reasons is that he says, um, people are aware of the problematic sexual behavior, but not the anger. Um, thought distortions, rationalizations, helping to avoid to take responsibility and unaware of family or, uh, dynamics or trauma. And then uh, he talks about this list of co-occurring conditions, stalking, trauma, trauma bonding, intimacy disorders, and with every, every lecture that I do that can go to a dark place, I like to remind people that um, there is recovery. 
And so here are some of the interventions for sexualized anger. Carnes names a couple. He talks about uh, looking at the arousal template. He has a really great exercise called the iceberg. And I think you can get it um, in uh, one of his books. And it's just uh, taking apart like your anger and then your history of anger and then um, looking at the patterns and the connections between the behavior and the anger. Um, another thing you can do is looking for uh, trauma is looking at the family of origin trauma and he does that he uses the uh, one of the things he uses is the trauma egg and that can be incredibly helpful for looking at the different um, pieces of trauma that may have impacted your template and then I want to add uh, in order to get recovered the recovery that I have seen happening on a deeper level is about being able to retrain the nervous system in relation to other people. So um, tools for slowing down the nervous system, which is basically when you're as a, as a therapist or a clinician or a coach, you're going to want to have a client come into your room and evoke that anger and that trauma in a very sensitive, careful, you know, monitored way and then be able to have them experience it and regulate them and experience it and regulate them, opening their window of tolerance so that they can learn that they can tolerate um, these feelings. And then taking what is learned in the therapy room, which is a Petri dish, and then taking that outside eventually into interpersonal relationships. Um, this is not a quick fix. People with histories of trauma um, it takes time because what has happened is, um, it's this, um, it used to be thought that, you know, you had a certain number of neurons you were born with and, and you, you use it or you lose it and, and you, you're stuck in your ways essentially. But research is, is not supporting that anymore. Research actually is showing that there are birth and development and reorganization of, of neurons throughout someone's lifespan. It's not as easy, um, but it's, it's definitely doable. So neurogenesis, the birth and development of new neurons, neuroplasticity, the reorganization of, neuros, uh, of nerve cells throughout the lifespan. Um, I, I talk with my clients about picturing a trench and, and that trench is what's been dug for someone's entire life, you know, just their way of doing something, their way of relating with people that may not be healthy or may be painful. And what you have to do within therapy, within yourself, within your whatever recovery groups you're going to is you have to dig a new trench and that trench has to be deeper than this trench. So as much focus and energy as you've put into this original trench, you need to now dig a new trench, a healthy trench, and the water will eventually go that way um, to the new healthy ways, but it's going to take time. So I hope this was uh, helpful. What I'm going to do now is put my information up here, and uh, I guess I can start taking questions. I'm not sure how to do this. Maybe uh, Chris can chime in. I don't even know if I'm being heard. <laughs> Hi, Jess. Yeah, this is Tom. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hey. Great to hear you. Um, so we had a question from Violet in Seattle. She said she's been trying out Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, but it's mm -hmm. just not cutting it. Mm -hmm. And Violet, I wonder if you might type in what's not cutting it. Um, so she's wondering what else to do other than maybe try Sexaholics Anonymous. So can right. you maybe speak about the different programs? Yes, I... Um... I want to normalize your feelings around sex, um, sex and love addicts anonymous and, and many 12 step programs. Um, I am a huge fan of them because I find that they can be incredibly normalizing and supportive. And, um, I also find that sometimes, um, people can feel very over pathologized in these programs and feeling like, um, they're being asked to do black and white things when humanity and sexuality is not black and white. Um, so I see I've been in it for five years and gotten sober from acting out, but can't stop the acting in stuff. Yes. So, um, yes, that's very common. Um, 
you cut out one, it's like whack-a-mole, right? Like you cut out one of the behaviors and it comes up in a different way, whether it's eating or gambling or um, working. And um, what would I say? Okay, uh, I would say try maybe online meetings um, if if you're uh, if you're if you're struggling with that. I'm, I'm seeing the word uh, anorexic, um, so emotionally anorexic. That's very common when you when you go to programs sometimes and they say cut this and this and this and this and this and this. And this um, you can develop a very safe place internally and not want to leave your hole. Um, so that is when you have to start calling yourself out in a kind way um, and being accountable for the acting in behaviors the same way that you would be accountable for acting out, making sure you're doing outreach calls. Um, let's see, I would, uh, if you're in one-on-one uh, -on -one therapy, I would, I would try that. Um, it's about building a community that is not any one community. It's just like building a, a very, a, just a vast community of people that understand what you're going through. I hope that helps. And Jess, we have uh, Aris Chelly from, Wars from Indiana. Uh, she asks, what are the second and third components of eroticized rage fusion? She only saw number one anger profiles. Uh, oh, <laughs> so I'm going back to my thing. Hold on one second. So the components are, sorry, hold on. So the profiles is the third. Uh, that is anger acting as a sexual stimulus. And the other two components are, the first one is anger occurs in high risk situations and fear situations. That's the first one. The second one is anger is central to the scenarios, the belief system in the arousal template. Um, and that is the historical experiences coming into play in your sexual experiences currently. Great, thanks. We have a question from Rachel in California. What are the ways to develop healthy trends? And do you merely resist unhealthy trends in the meantime, hoping they will eventually become undesirable? Ah, white knuckling. Um, <laughs> well, you could try that. Um, but my guess is, um, you know, if, if it would have worked, it, it would have worked if it could have um, white knuckling, but it hasn't. So, um, what I find is accountability. Um, I'm sorry, what is the first part of the question again? What are the ways to develop healthy trends? Right, okay, yes. Um, so all of the things that are hurting you, write a list of that. Um, and then what are opposite actions you can take? Uh, and use that as a framework. Um, I mean, that would be my suggestion. Um, I also think that it really is about accountability because um, as they say in a lot of the programs, you know, um, it's really hard for an unhealthy mind to hold yourself accountable because we're very smart and we wanna figure out ways to get around having to do things that are painful. So, um, so having people that you have to be accountable to, um, really close friends that understand what you're going through and are supportive or partners or um, therapists, coaches, um, so that they can call you out on your BS, you know, and um, in a loving way. <laughs> and so that you can internalize that, holding yourself accountable eventually. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question from Avi in Venice Beach, California. Hi, Jess. Do you find that ER is one of the leading components of fetishism? Um, that these conditions often drive those desires? Thanks. No. <laughs> um, no, I, I don't. Uh, I actually don't. Um, I think that um, 
it's really dependent upon the person coming in. You know, I think that fetishism is um, an expression of sexuality that is not inherently pathological. And I think that um, if I have a client that comes in and says, I have this fetish and it is impacting negatively my social, emotional, occupational functioning, um, then I explore where that might be coming from, you know, but if they are enjoying the fetish, then, you know, um, I, I don't, I don't see, I don't see eroticized rage or sexualized anger, you know, like inherent in, in fetishism. Um, and Abby, Abby follows up saying if it's, she agrees with that, or he agrees with that, sorry, if it's an addiction, essentially, part of an otherwise addictive profile they're talking about. Oh, okay. Um, so if I'm guessing you're talking about sexual addiction and a form of that. Um, hmm. In my experience, um, if it's a form of addictive behavior that is harming either yourself or someone else, uh, I have seen, I have seen a lot of anger under there, but I've seen underneath the anger shame. Um, and um, yeah, a lot of shame. So I would be curious about that anger. Um, I hope that helps. Great, and we have a question from Eric in New Jersey. Do you advocate healthy masturbation for a client who is acting out with excessive behaviors? Hmm. Um, well, I can only speak for, I can only speak for, you know, the people that I've worked with. And, um, but um, I really, I do believe that if someone has addictive behaviors, you have to get a baseline. You know, and I would say to that client, I'm not going to tell you you cannot masturbate because as a therapist, I can't really demand that anyone do anything. What I will say is that have you ever had a baseline of what your body is like sans masturbation, sans this addictive behavior? Um, and why not just have an experiment like that, you know, and get to know what you might be like without it. You can always go back to it, you know? And if, and if they can't, then you have some information there. If they can't take those 30 days or those 90 days, that's really good information to have. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a message from Deborah. I have a client that has had sex with no anger and then out of anger, my client attacked the partner's manhood. The next time my client had sex with this person, uh, they were very aggressive. My client was hurt and doesn't want to have sex with this person ever again, which is this is experience has traumatized my client. Would this mean that this person has some trauma that would lead to sexualized anger upon my client? My client and I talked about being assaulted. Mm, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um... Honestly, before I even touch the sexualized anger, I want to deal with the trauma with the client. Um, I mean, I, what I'm hearing is that the client has fear that in addition to the original trauma, she's now going to have this um, lingering potential pathology on top of it. And um, I, I, I would really just go into that trauma and sit with her on that and sit with her with this concept of are you are you concerned about this other pathology and and what's that about you know this lingering um, traumatic reaction great um, and let me just follow up with a question about that how do um, is it possible to discern eroticized rage in other people like that's to know right. when that's acting right yeah um well i would always ask the client you know i'm not going to assume um i usually don't give people diagnoses without them being on board you know at, in a new uh, um in um 
meaning, is this what you're feeling? And asking them if my assumption is accurate. So if I have a client that comes in and they are presenting with rage or anger in their sexuality, I will say something like, wow, that sounds really angry. I, I felt a lot of anger when I heard you just talk about that. You know, do you feel anger there? And explore it. And, and you know, I don't go around giving people the label of, you know, sexual, you're, you're sexually angry. You know, it, this is just a concept that um, is a piece of an overall picture of clients. Makes sense. Um, from Paul in Mississippi, one of your slides showed you regulate me. So is healthy sexuality or healthy humanity more like we regulate each other? Co-regulation. Oh, I know. Yeah, it's interesting. That's the first time it's been brought up. Um, <laughs> it was kind of a quip uh, because of that uh, movie, um, You Complete Me. And I do believe that in a healthy world and in healthy relationships, there's nothing wrong with co-regulation. That is what's going on between partners. Um, but when you are looking to your partner for them to regulate you because you do not have that capacity within yourself, you are putting yourself in a very vulnerable and, and unhealthy place, I think. I think that each person needs to be able to, in some respect, regulate themselves so that they are not dependent on the outside world to regulate them. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Brittany in Calgary, Canada. How do you work with individuals and couples as they work through this who have sexual trauma that has been reenacted in their current relationship and now continues to affect their sexual interactions with their partner? How can partners work together to heal each other's sexual trauma versus reenacting it inadvertently? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, there's a really wonderful book um, with a really, um, with the type, it's called Sexual Healing. Um, I believe it's by Wendy Maltz. Um, and it is a way of unpacking sexual trauma. And then at the back of the book, which I find very helpful, are these exercises that couples can do together to reintegrate um, sexuality in a new healthy way into their relationship, just basic touching. And then, you know, it just um, increases as you feel comfortable. But again, I think it's about flatlining it. Um, and until both partners feel safe, um, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and then slowly reintegrating sexuality in a healthy way. Thank you. We have uh, Cassandra from Arizona. Can you speak to ER and sexual offending, particularly with those who offend against children? No, I can't. Um, I, uh, that is out of my scope. Um, I, that's a whole different ball game. And, um, it, yeah, sorry, I can't. Thank you. Um, and Eric from New Jersey asks, a female client feels overwhelmed with her husband's advances, which she has always felt have been aggressive and not tender. Any thoughts to help redirect her husband's approaches? helping her redirect her husband's approaches or having the husband come in and working with them together? Right, either way I imagine. But I, um, I think it refers to helping her redirect her husband's approaches. Uh, gosh, this is, you know, this is kind of tricky because I don't know these situations. Like I'm not, I, I don't know these cases very well and I don't wanna just give you a blanket answer, especially when there is aggressiveness in um in the situation uh, i would be curious about if there's other potential dv happening or is it only in sexuality um and you know i think 
it's important for uh, partners to assert their boundaries and assert when something is harmful to them and leaving them feeling unsafe. Um, that's about as much as I can go there. And Eric clarifies about having the husband come in and helping the husband redirect his. If he's on board, I think that's awesome. Again, I would, um, I would be very careful to make sure there's no other DV going on in the home if, or any DV going on in the home. And then um, I would have a reflecting, you know, I would, I would have the two partners uh, saying things like, when you do this, it makes me feel I statements, you know, and so that um, the husband can gain a level, a new, a new level of empathy for his wife. Great, thanks. And just for our viewers, uh, DV meaning domestic violence. Yes, sorry. Um, okay, we have a question from Danielle. Uh, we have a statement. Um, I was raped by definition of the word by my husband early in our relationship on multiple occasions. Because it was mo more coercive than purely physical force, I didn't acknowledge the behavior for what it was at the time due to love addiction issues I had. Here we are 15 years later, marriage counseling has not worked through our problems because I'm ready to face my own addiction issues. And it is too painful for him to acknowledge the reality of my experience in our sexual history. I'm looking for suggestions on processing this sexual trauma and later sexualized anger that I acted out 13 years into the relationship. Long message, I hope this makes sense. And she also follows up saying, I struggle with feeling it is not right to discuss my experience with mutual friends because I still feel the need to protect him in some way from their judgment. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I really hope that you are seeing a therapist um, and or, or a counselor of some sort and, and um, getting support because I think that um, the more internal resources you can build, the stronger you will be at setting boundaries and holding them. Um, I would say that um, a good boundary book uh, is, uh, there's one actually just called Boundaries um, by Catherine. And then there's um, another boundary book by Vicki Tilwell Palmer, and she's really amazing. And I would, um, I'd recommend those, um, and and it sounds like you you you've got a lot of work to do on yourself. And once you get grounded in that, my guess is you will be able to assert yourself. Great, thanks, Jess. Um, and just to reminder to those joining us just by phone, if you want to email questions to Tom at centerforhealthysex dot com, I can read them. Uh, and we can also open up the phone line for questions in a little bit. If I, I also feel like I'm doing like a commercial, like an ongoing commercial for all of these, <laughs> for all of these writers. It's kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we have Cassandra from Arizona, uh, who adds to that that Brittany and Peggy Kleinplatz has some great writings on the topic you brought up, and maybe check her out too. Yeah, I my clients actually make fun of me because I love the word boundaries and I use it all the time. Um, so big fan. Great. Um, I'm just curious, how has, uh, studying about eroticized rage, uh, impacted your therapy and how have, how have, has it helped your clients? Hmm. So, helping my clients it's helped to normalize some of the confusing feelings that they have uh, because you can feel many things at the same time and um, anger uh, is just is one of the many feelings and um, it's helped me it's helped signal to me that underneath that anger because anger is a more primitive feeling um, underneath it is a, a lot of times a deeper shame an internal conflict um, with what you feel like you should be doing versus what you are doing. Um, and in my therapy in working with people, I feel like learning about 
sexualized anger has been great because it's just uh, it's another piece of the puzzle of clients coming in. You know, we're so complex and, you know, it's not one, it's usually not one reason people come in, you know, it's, it's a multitude of things converging and just presenting as behaviors. Um, and I, I do believe that sexualized anger is a way that people are acting out as Kadeheka says in this mime language of sex, you know, we're acting out these deeper implicit memories. Um, and as Vanderkolk talks about in repetition compulsion, unlike Freud who believed that you repeat these behaviors to master them <clears throat> eventually, Vanderkolk says, you know, you're not, you're not mastering them. What you're doing is you're, you're more deeply ingraining the pain and the hurt. And so bringing the stuff to surface, I really think helps to slow down those behaviors. Great, thanks. And I know you've said you don't diagnose someone with eroticized rage. Right. But how would you use this material to inform your therapy with that client? Um, that's a really good question. That's a hard one, Tom. Um, <laughs> um, how would I use it to inform my client? I would, I would use it to normalize their experience. You know, I would, I would use it in saying, uh, like if someone presents with, you know, they have come to me and said, I'm having a problem. I'm very, uh, I have a lot of, uh, anger towards my partner. I'm having all of these Twitter firestorms with them. Um, I would just look at the deeper components of that anger, you know, and the history of that anger. I help, I use it to help uncover um, deeper experiences. Great. Thank you. Does that answer it? Oh yeah. You bet. <laughs> um, and we have another question from Eric Larson. Um, Jess, do you provide a sec psychosexual intake with each and every one of your appropriate clients? Of the appropriate clients, yes. 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 I, I mean, it is not one size fits all, you know. Um, and, um, and you have to, it, it also takes time. I mean, you can have the psychosexual assessment, but, you know, until the client feels comfortable in your office, it, things may not come out, you know, other pieces that would have been great information on the assessment. Great. And for the layman, can you just explain a little bit about what a psychosexual intake is and how it's used? Well, I think different clinicians have different versions of it. Um, essentially, it's like... Um, it's a history of sexual, the way I see it is it's a history of sexuality and any um, important events that may have happened, a sexual timeline. Um, and, um, and then I take that information and I start going um, across anxiety, depression, like rattling through the different presenting diagnoses um, and how that their sexuality might be impacting all of these feelings that they're having and um, what behaviors are harmful to them, harmful to their partners, if any. Um, yeah, that's how I do it. Great. And we have a question from Araceli. Uh, do you need to be a psychologist to do a psychosexual assessment? And do you have a template you can share? I do not have a template I can share. And um, I am not a psychologist. I'm an MFT. Um, so I, uh, I think, you know, when I, what I'm hearing as a psychosexual assessment, I'm also, I use as an intake for people that are coming in um, with problematic sexual behaviors. So um, it's not, I'm not giving a test. And I do believe that it's the psychologists that give tests um, for the most part. Great. Thanks. Um We've got about five minutes left. Why don't we go ahead and um, open up the call to phone people. So um, I'm going to unmute. All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six.
So if anyone wants to ask a question, just press star six and we'll be able to hear you. And we have a message from Chanan uh, that says you can find sexual history templates online. Thank you for that. Yes, I have one. I just don't share it. I think that many clinicians have them. They just, uh, they're very specific to each clinician and how they run their practice. Right. Someone else, Bobby writes, it's best to write your own. Honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> All right, so does anyone have a question for us? Star six. <laughs> great, well. well yeah, I hope it's yeah, been helpful. Oh, it's been great, thank you. I think this is a very interesting topic for people. Um, I think we all know there's a point when a person goes over into an internal experience in their relating with someone um, in a romantic or sexual way that obviously doesn't seem to have a lot to do with what's going on at hand, but seems like it's bringing some kind of history along. And I think people have a, you know, kind of intuitive understanding of this subject. So it's great to get some clear information about it. Uh, what's next for you? What's your next subject? Oh, I am putting together, oh, my next subject. Uh, I think it's going to have to do with partners because I really love working with um, betrayed partners and it's so special to me. And I want to put together um, an intensive weekend for partners. So uh, that's what I'm working on. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us today, Jess. Um, I hope all of you had a good experience here and uh, we'll watch the recording or share it which will be on our youtube channel that's youtube.com center for health backslash center for healthy sex oh can i say something yeah you bet okay i want uh i wanted people to um, follow me on twitter if you're interested because i i just discovered it and i really like it <laughs> so it's jess leveth mft i think on twitter great and we can put that in the YouTube recording uh, description. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Great. Um, everyone, please join us. We'll have a couple more webinars coming up in our series. Alexandra Katahakis will be presenting on Monday, February 13th, uh, on the meditation from our book, Mirror of Intimacy. And the theme is going to be true love, just in time for Valentine's Day. And next month in our guest expert webinar series, we'll be hosting Cara Tripodi, and she will be talking about intimate treason, steps to healing for partners of sex addicts. She's awesome. Cara's awesome. You should come watch it. Yeah. So that'll be March 10th. Thanks, everyone. Have a great February. Thank you, Jess, so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time. See you later.